By way of introduction, my name is Alex Duffy. I am the Portfolio Manager of Fidelity's Global Emerging Market Equity Fund, which is a strategy that I've been managing since its inception in 2013, having spent my career working across all of the regions that comprise global emerging markets, starting in emerging Europe, Middle East, Africa, then moving to Latin America before relocating to Asia to manage the Global Emerging Market Equity Fund. Let's turn now to look at global emerging market equities in a little more detail. What do we mean by global emerging markets? Really, what is this asset class and what does it represent? We can see that global emerging markets, the countries that comprise global emerging markets, account for currently around 60% of global economic output. So global GDP, emerging market companies account for 60% of that global GDP. In addition to that, of incremental economic growth globally, emerging markets account for around 65 to 70%. And thus, over time, emerging markets are increasing in terms of their importance to the global economy. Now, despite the size of emerging market countries and their contributions to global output, the actual asset class of emerging market equities, the companies that reside within the emerging markets, is significantly underrepresented within global equity portfolios. And so on the right-hand side of this graphic here, we can see that in the standard MSCI World Index, emerging markets account for just under 12% of that investment universe. So of a global weighting, a global allocation to equity portfolios, emerging markets would account for around 12% versus a contribution to global GDP of emerging market countries, which is around 60%. Now, it's firmly our view that over time, as a consequence of the positive demographics of the asset class, which we'll touch on in a moment, and as a consequence of the deepening of financial markets in emerging markets, we will see that representation increase over the coming years. And so whilst emerging market equities may not be front and centre of mind for investors today, over time, it's firmly our view that they're only going to become more important. And that is why it's important to focus on them today. In addition to that global output, we can see that actually emerging markets are the bulk of the young population of the world. So when we look at developed markets, countries like Japan, Germany, the UK, the US, the average median age, median age of workers in those countries is in the high 30s to early 40s. Conversely, in emerging markets, it's in the high 20s to early 30s. That means as we move over the next 10 to 15 years, the majority of workers in developed markets will be retiring and drawing down on savings, so this saving, whereas in emerging markets, you've got a growing young population and workforce, which is only going to see increases in its consumption levels and in its savings rates as those economies develop. And so whilst these countries are relatively small in terms of global consumption today. They're starting from very low levels of penetration with young workforces. And over time, as these countries develop, we firmly expect to see those markets grow at a higher rate to what we see currently in developed markets, and therefore the opportunity set for investing within emerging markets to increase over time. Now, that is not to say that there are not risks of investing in this asset class, and clearly there are. And so whilst there is a very positive thematic backdrop in terms of positive demographics, low penetration levels, and underdeveloped markets, there are also important risk factors which we have to be aware of, which can lead to adverse returns for investors. Not least the fact that these are relatively nascent and therefore new markets that tend to have less sophisticated and underdeveloped financial systems and may indeed have more political and economic and currency volatility as a consequence of that. And so it's critical to understand how you address those risk factors and seek to mitigate those risk factors whilst providing exposure to the positive attributes of investing within the asset class. And it's the mitigation of those risk factors and how I actually manage the portfolio in a, on a day-to-day -day basis to address those risk factors to which I'm now going to turn. From a philosophical point of view, I'm really seeking just to own good businesses that I understand, and I seek to own those businesses for as long as possible. So this is a, a long-term, focused approach to investing within global emerging markets. Risk, to me, 
is the probability of a permanent loss of capital. And that is the risk factor that I'm seeking to mitigate as far as possible. Through my experience of investing in emerging markets, I tend to find that that risk can mainly manifest itself in either poor corporate governance or poor balance sheet structure. So risk factors associated with the businesses that we're invested in and the countries that we're invested in. And I address those risk factors up front through a detailed understanding of the companies that we're engaging with to ensure that we have appropriate alignment between our interests as minority shareholders and the interests of the other key stakeholders within the business. At the same time, I think that there's a great opportunity to create value for investors through owning good businesses, businesses that invest in their companies profitably and seeking to own those companies for a three to five year investment time period at least. And so our approach is firmly to understand the risks of the companies and the countries in which we're invested in at the outset, understand the strengths of the business model and how those strengths are evolving over a three to five year time horizon, and then simply own those good companies for at least that length of time to enable the portfolio to benefit from the profitable growth that those companies are able to deliver. That growth has to be matched or at least supported over the long term through a commitment to pay dividends to the shareholders. Because ultimately, it's through the remittance of dividends that shareholders are remunerated for their investments in the companies. And so dividends are an important underpin in terms of the discipline of the approach. Turn into the investment approach in a little more detail on the next slide. There are really five key stages that all stocks go through as they're being considered for investment by myself and the investment team here at Fidelity. The first stage is a thorough understanding of the corporate governance and the business practices of the company in question. What we seek to do here is to really understand the incentives of the other stakeholders who we're investing alongside and of the management team who run the company on our behalf. What are those managers incentivized to do? And what are the other shareholders in a company seeking to achieve from the corporate entity? The answer to those questions will go a long way to determining how a company allocates its costs, the types of projects that it invests in, and ultimately the sustainability of the profits that that business is able to generate. So understanding corporate governance is critical. The second key stage of the investment process is a thorough analysis of the balance sheet of a company. Is this a company which has appropriate cash resources to fund its investment opportunities to meet its financial obligations? Or is it a company which uses excessive levels of debt in order to finance its operations? Again, the answer to that question is critical to determining the risk-adjusted returns that a company can offer because companies that have high levels of debt that don't match the volatility of their overall earnings profile across the economic cycle are likely to have to come back to shareholders to raise capital in the future. And so we really seek to understand the, how that balance sheet structure matches the cash flow profile and the profit profile of the business to ensure that as shareholders, we have adequate headroom in terms of balance sheet and debt capacity. Once we've addressed those two key factors and we've understood the type of business that we're invested in, we really seek to understand the sustainability of the profit profile of the business. So what is it about this particular company, about the good or the service that it delivers, that enables it to consistently generate profits in excess of the costs of running that operation and in excess of the costs that shareholders charge to that business? So what is the sustainability of that return profile? How does that profit profile evolve over a three to five year investment time horizon as a consequence of competitive intensity? So we analyze the industry structure. We look at what competitors are doing in terms of launching products that might attack an existing business. And we look at how companies are preparing themselves to deal with those competitive threats, what the cost of that competitive mitigation is likely to be, and ultimately what that means for the future profit generation of the business in question. 
Once we've understood the sustainability, the consistency of the underlying profit generation of a business, the next question becomes, how does the company use the excess profit that it is earning to reinvest in its business? And this is really where we seek to access that growth opportunity that global emerging markets offer. How is the company redeploying its excess cash generation? So is it building new factories? Is it opening new stores? Is it investing in new technology? And most importantly, how much can it invest in those new areas? And at what level of profit should we expect those new investments to generate in the future? And looking at that reinvestment opportunity over a three to five year investment time horizon enables us to build up a picture of what the future profit generation of the business in question is likely to be. Once we have conviction in that, the final stage becomes valuing that future profit stream. And this is where we seek to bring back the future profitability of a company to a starting point today to ensure that we are given an adequate margin of safety for our investment today, typically on a free cash flow yield, so the free cash that a business is generating versus the market capitalization of that company, which can be crudely thought of as an interest coupon for shareholders, a free cash flow yield on the business. And ultimately, it is this confluence of understanding real risk from governance and balance sheet perspectives, understanding sustainability of profit generation and how excess profit gets reinvested back into the business, and then having a very strong valuation discipline to ensure that we have an appropriate margin of safety and that we're paid today for the risks we are taking in the business that helps to ensure that we have a balanced portfolio of high conviction stock ideas that provide exposure to the positive attributes of investing within global emerging markets whilst mitigating some of the negative risk factors that come with investing in the asset class, namely the governance and the volatility risk that I alluded to earlier on. This is a very absolute approach to investing in the asset class. Every business is looked at on its own merits, and the process results in a relatively concentrated portfolio. So 37 stocks sit within the fund today across the emerging market universe. What are the outcomes from that investment process? Well, what we can see on the next slide is that generally speaking, the portfolio has dividends that are more than adequately covered by the cash flow of the business in question. And indeed, the dividend cover of the stocks within the fund is greater than that of the dividend cover of the stocks held in the broader investment universe. And we've used the widely adopted MSCI Emerging Markets Index to reference the portfolio against in this example. You can see the prudence of the balance sheet structures. So the net debt to equity is shown as a negative number. That means that the companies held in aggregate within the portfolio have net cash positions on their balance sheets versus the broader investment universe, which has a net debt exposure. And then most interestingly, I believe in this graphic here, you can see the levels of profit generation of the stocks held within the portfolio. For every dollar invested in the business, the company is generating return on that capital invested again, far in excess of what is being offered by the broader investment universe. And then finally, the valuation as exhibited by the free cash flow yield on the portfolio. You can see that we've got a free cash flow yield again, in excess of that on offer by the broader investment universe. So strong balance sheets, adequate dividend cover, very healthy returns on invested capital, so lots of good profitability, but we haven't paid away for that in valuation. So that valuation discipline coming through to provide a margin of safety at the individual portfolio level. What has that led to in terms of outcomes for clients invested within the portfolio? What you can see on the next slide is that owning good companies companies that generate returns in excess of their cost of equity creates value. And so the annualized alpha of the portfolio is in the top 16th percentile of the asset class. But I think most interestingly, it's the risk adjusted returns that come through here. We see that focus on governance, on balance sheet structures, consistency of return profiles, 
A creative reinvestment in the business and a valuation underpin has led to lower drawdown on average than, than the investment universe. So, so maximum drawdown on the far right hand side of this graphic being in the top 13th percentile. So very healthy risk adjusted returns and relatively attractive information ratios. So accuracy of our stock picks delivering returns for the portfolio. Turning now just to bring this process to life with some examples of stocks that are held within the fund to give you a flavor of the types of businesses that we're invested in and to marry together how we think about that thematic reinvestment opportunity of the asset class whilst mitigating some of the risk factors of investing in the asset class. And I'm going to start with a company that we've held for some years, a company called Bank Central Asia, which is Indonesia's third largest bank. And critically, Bank Central Asia is the only large privately held bank and privately managed bank in Indonesia. The other banks in Indonesia are typically government owned banking operations. That management structure of Bank Central Asia has very important implications for how the bank's management team think about risk. So this is a predominantly family owned business. The major shareholder is an Indonesian family. And they think very carefully about the types of loans that they are prepared to underwrite because they know they will not have the support of the Indonesian government should they run into financial difficulties. That has very important implications for how they think about growing their loan portfolio over time and how they think about risk adjusted returns. And it ensures a very prudent approach to the management of the bank in terms of how they fund the bank so they can prevent banking runs and also how they manage their capital positions. And if you think back to the financial crisis, the two biggest issues at that point of time for the banking sector was a lack of capital and then what we call a duration mismatch in funding. So banks not being able to access credit quickly enough to provide capital to their borrowers. BCA is a bank that has a capital ratio far in excess of any global norm and any regulatory norm in order to enable it to withstand severe economic shocks and and losses on its loan portfolio should they materialize. And its balance sheet also has an abundance of very low cost, long duration, sticky financing because of its strong deposit taking operations. And so it doesn't run those same mismatches from a duration perspective that we've seen elsewhere in the world. In addition to that, because of the focus on risk management and only lending to clients who have a strong willingness and ability to repay their loans, the bank is consistently able to generate returns on its asset base far in excess of 3%. To provide some context, Returns on assets, so for every loan that a bank offers, the return that it generates from that loan, in global averages would be around 1%. So BCA, on an underlying basis, runs a profitability level, which is roughly triple that of global norms. And it's able to consistently, because of the excess capital on the balance sheet, because of that attractive underlying profit generation, it's able to consistently generate a return on its own equity base in excess of 20%, and that is what drives the share price over time. And so if you look at the absolute share price on the blue line in US dollar terms on the graphic, you can see that it's delivered very healthy absolute returns over the last five years. In addition, the superior levels of profitability versus that on offer for the investment class as a whole has led to a significant excess return versus the investment universe. So healthy absolute returns, even healthier relative returns. The next stock that I wanted to highlight is a consumer business called Lojas Rena, which is Brazil's largest consumer apparel company, clothing retailer. Brazil is a market and as a country that has been through a very, very difficult economic time since 2015. And indeed, the Brazilian economy has witnessed the most severe recession anywhere globally in peacetime. So it gives you a sense of the size of the contraction that we've seen in the Brazilian economy over 2014 and 15 and 16 as a consequence of the commodity downturn and political instability within Brazil. Now, Lojas Rena as a stock despite that is again another business which is able to deliver very healthy returns despite some of the challenges of the investment backdrop. 
This is a company which has a long history of best in class corporate governance and a very clear incentive profile for its management team that encourages the managers to think very prudently and carefully about how they grow the business and to think very prudently and carefully about the types of investment risks they're willing to undertake as they seek to grow the business. What that has led to is a business which hasn't taken on significant balance sheet risk, which was a challenge for a number of other Brazilian corporates through the good times. And that prudence has enabled the business to really take advantage of the challenges that its competitors have faced within Brazil through this difficult economic contraction. So since 2015, 30% of Brazilian retailing space has closed as a consequence of the recession. Despite that backdrop, Lojas Renner has been able to increase its retail space by 7 to 8% a year and maintain levels of profitability because of the fact that they have a best-in-class operation, because of the fact that they've invested significantly in local sourcing and procurement to insulate themselves from some of the currency risks that Brazil has faced over that time period and because of the fact that they only undertake investment projects, that they have a high degree of conviction in delivering a return profile that meets their thresholds, and they don't finance that or with excessive levels of debt. And so that has led to a situation where Lojas Renner's competitive position has enhanced significantly through the last three to five years. And as Brazil emerges from this recession and the consumption class starts to grow again, Lojas Renner is in pole position to deliver high quality, good product to that customer base at a low and affordable price point. And that sets the base for, for profitable growth over the coming three, five years and beyond. And we can see that that has been, despite some volatility, has been reflected in the stock price where, again, we've delivered positive absolute dollar returns over a five-year time period despite such a painful economic contraction. And versus uh, global emerging market equities, it again has been a very, very healthy return within the portfolio. So this is a stock which is newer to the portfolio. It's entered the fund within the last 12 months. But it is a very good business that we've had high conviction in for some time. And again, through my history of investing in the asset class, I've been able to follow this company since 2008 and therefore have a long history of, of understanding the management team and are able to own the position size in a real level that can make a difference to the portfolio as a consequence of that. So I will conclude with those remarks. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time to listen today. We hope you found it informative. And should you wish to have any further information about Fidelity, about the Fidelity Global Emerging Markets Equity Fund, then your relevant sales counterpart will be more than happy to engage with you on those questions. Thank you very much indeed and have a good day.